You're listening to Sarah Hagen backstage with interviews and insights from years inside the music industry. Join Sarah as she talks with masters of their crafts, finding out what makes them tick both inside and outside of the music business. This week, Sarah talks with Gavin Harrison. Welcome to Sarah Hagen Backstage. Today, I am so excited to have Gavin Harrison on the show. Gavin is a true drummer's drummer, and he is best known as the drummer in the progressive rock bands King Crimson, Pineapple Thief, and Porcupine Tree. Gavin is also an in-demand clinician and studio musician. Today, we are going to talk to Gavin about how he got his start in the industry and how he became one of the world's most respected drummers. Stay tuned for an inside look into the life of Gavin Harrison. Hey, Gavin. Welcome to Sarah Hagen Backstage. Hello. Welcome to my backstage. Yes. there. <laughs> right behind you is your backstage, right? Exactly. At least for now. Oh, well, thank you so much for being here today. I so appreciate you taking some time. We're really excited to talk with you today about um, your career and what you're up to now. But I think we want to start by going back a little ways and talking about your start um, in music. And um, I don't think we've ever talked about this, you know, how you kind of got started playing the drums and um, what made you want to start playing. So um, if you can give us an idea of how that all came about, that would be great. Yeah, sure. I mean, my dad was a professional jazz trumpet player. So I was always around music probably before I can even remember, you know, my dad liked playing music in the house. Sometimes I can remember him having friends over and them having a jam in the, in the front room. And so I was very excited about music. I loved music. Uh, me and my brothers all tried to play the trumpet. Um, I was probably the worst of the three of us. Uh, it just wasn't me. I was into dancing. I was in dance school when I was six. Um, and then a friend of my dad's, a very nice drummer called Freddie Adamson, you know, he gave me some drumsticks and I just took to it like, oh yeah, this is me, you know, playing on the, on the sofa, playing on the bed, pots and pans, the usual sort of thing. But it just felt right to me. And I, I guess I was, I had some amount of coordination and, you know, I just loved music. I mean, there'd be times where my dad would take the whole family to a pub where he was doing a, a sort of lunchtime jazz gig. And I just fell in love with the whole, the whole thing about being a musician. And pretty much from age six, I made my mind up. That's what I was going to do. There was never any question or doubt that I was going to do anything else. And I just had my head down that's what I was going to do. I just, when I, as soon as, as soon as I could leave school, which in the UK at that time was age 16, I left school and um, I, I started to play professionally. That's amazing. Um, you know, I, I, you hear it a lot from professional musicians that, um, you know, they were into whatever instrument or singing, um, whatever music they were playing at the time when they were young. And, just that's what they had focused on. That's what they really, really wanted to do with their life. And I think that, you know, that kind of passion pushes you through. Um, and so you mentioned you were, uh, you took dance lessons. Um, what, what kind of dance was it? Were you doing tap or? Yeah, I mean, I could, I could tap dance, uh, but the school I ended up in was more of a ballet school. Mm -hmm. And age six, I mean, I was the only boy there. It was kind of weird. You're, you're not that comfortable in a, being the only boy in a group of girls age mm -hmm. six. If I'd have just stayed another 10 years. <laughs> anyway, um, so I, I quit that. It was one of those fad things where I said, hey, I want to be a dancer. Mm -hmm. my parents got me some dance lessons. And then, you know, as kids are two or three months later, I said, I don't want to do that anymore but I'd already started with the drumsticks and I'd already started just tapping around, 
my dad could play a bit of drums and mm -hmm. he used to play brushes on a magazine and I thought oh that's good fun so we used to play brushes on a magazine playing along to jazz records just playing time you know and um so I thought that was fabulous fun it was also having a, a dad who was uh, a professional musician in the sort of center of the music industry of that time in London, I, I later realized what an amazing sort of education my childhood was. Because many of my friends, you know, they, li they lived way out of London. Mm -hmm. Drummer friends that I know now, they didn't grow, they weren't born into musical families. They grew up way out of London being the capital sort of, you know, center of music and just dreamed one day, oh, when I'm big enough and I'm good enough, I'm going to move to London. I'm going to try to do something in London. So I was already born into it. And when I think of the experiences I had as a child and my dad taking me to sessions, he would take me to um, my dad worked in a nightclub called the Talk of the Town. It was a Las Vegas style cabaret club. Wow. And, yeah, they would have um, international stars come and do a, a month of cabaret, uh, like Judy Garland, Stevie Wonder, Diana Ross, uh, Mel Torme, uh, a massive list of people. And whenever there was a, you know, quite often these people, these stars would bring their own MD, usually a keyboard player, and they sometimes bring a, an American drummer with them. Um, and so if my dad thought it was really educational to me, mm -hmm. he would take me to the rehearsal in the afternoon and I would stand next to the percussionist. Um, a bit later, when I was about 12 years old, I would actually stand on stage with a black bow tie and a white shirt and a black jacket so I didn't stand out to the audience. And I could stand and watch, you know, Stevie Wonder's band playing. Uh, you know, I saw... Uh, I, I got down in the afternoon, uh, Pearl Bailey was, you know, one month Pearl Bailey was the singer and her husband, Louis Belson, was there. Mm -hmm. and wow. I've got a nice picture to send you of that. And I sat on Louis' drums and I was about 13 and I sat next to him during the rehearsal. I mean, you know, how many 13-year-olds get to sit next to Louis Belson for the day? It's just, it was an incredible uh musical sort of education to me mm -hmm. it was like the music school of life I, right. saw, I saw real musicians high level professional players working on a daily basis recording or playing in this nightclub so it, it was amazing actually I, I always dreamt about going to a music school later on in life but I, I never did that that is amazing though I mean you grew up right in it you know, um, I don't, I can't think of a better education than to just observe not only, you know, drummers, the, the, the instrument that you wanted to play, but the interaction between all the, the musicians and really like top level talent. That's, that's just incredible. Um, and so, you know, I, we think about the, the tough times some drummers, some young drummers have kind of convincing their parents that they want to play drums and, you know, getting, getting through that um, barrier of, um, you know, getting into this, this loud <laughs> instrument that takes up a lot of space in the home. Um, but it sounds like you had support right from the start with your dad. Oh yeah. And my mom too. My mom was very, very supportive. She was a stay at home mom. You know, sometimes I can remember I would be in a room when I was a, probably 17, 18, I bought this enormous Gretsch kit with two bass drums and about seven tom-toms. And I was in there <laughs> playing, sweating away and bashing the drums. And I'd open the door. My mum is sitting right outside the door ironing, you know. <laughs> she just sort of tolerated, well, not tolerated. She, she was very happy to, she never once said, oh God, can't you keep the noise down or, it, she was totally into it. She she was very, very supportive of me. And, of course, my dad was too. And my dad's friends, lots of his, um, you know, band mates and, and session mates were were so supportive. They, their eyes would light up. When I used to come to a session when I was a little kid, you know, and the drummer would say, oh, hey, 
bring Gavin over here. Let me get a chair. Let me put it there. Sit next to the drummer in the middle of a big band. And it was, oh, it was just incredible. That is amazing. That's amazing. Um, you know, encountering musicians that, that kind of like take you under their wing and, and want you to succeed is, I think, um, it's key, you know, that support is, is pretty key. Um, and I have, you must have a lot of memories. I have memories of, you know, being a kid and specific songs that were playing in the background of whatever was happening at the time that I hear them today. And it just like brings back that moment, that feeling. And you can, you know, just almost, you know, you can just imagine that scene happening in your life and you must have a lot of those moments. Oh yeah, I remember in in 1973, my dad bought this record. It was by um, a composer called Patrick Williams, who was actually quite a famous uh, arranger composer. Um, and he did a lot of TV themes. I think he did The Streets of San Francisco. That's one of Pat Williams, really good big band arranger. And my dad brought this record home called Threshold. The drummer was John Guerin. It's the most incredibly progressive jazz big band album. They're playing rock. They're playing funk. There's, um, you know, lots of weird orchestrations going on. There's tabla playing. Lots wow. of things you wouldn't imagine in a big band. And John Guerin was, like, really hot. 1973, he's got rotor toms. He's got all these <laughs> sounds. Um, there's percussionists putting gongs into water, all those things you probably heard on those, you know, those um, Clint Eastwood, Dirty Harry films, mm -hmm. San Francisco, that very progressive big band sound. And my dad loved this album, as did, well, pretty much every musician that we knew at the time. And my dad would crank it up really loud and we would sit, you know, listen with a with the big uh, hi-fi speakers and I got so excited listening, and I still get excited listening to that record. Um, other records I can remember, you know, getting into the, the era of cassette, mm -hmm. a cassette that had, uh, you know, one album on one side, one album on the other side. And when I was probably 18, 19, and I started working a lot in London, I had this cassette that just played nonstop. One side was a Randy Crawford album, called Secret Combination. And the other the other side of the cassette was a Randy Crawford album called, um, uh, oh God, what is it? Oh, I'll think of it in a minute. Okay. <laughs> the following album. Uh, oh, anyway, Jeff Beccaro plays on both of those records. Oh, wow. And so I just kind of felt, you know, every time I drove to London, that take me like, anywhere between half an hour and an hour, depending on the traffic. Um, I would just be listening to Jeff the whole way there and the whole way back. And there's a section of, there's a road called the A40 flyover and you come into London from the West and you come up over the brow and then suddenly you can see the whole of London city. Mm. It's a moment where you come out and you can see all of Manhattan coming from, um, you know, the New Jersey side. Yes, yes. There's a moment you come round a bend, oh, wow, and there's Manhattan. And that was my moment of coming up over this hill and then seeing London and knowing that I was going to be part of it that night and listening to Jeff. Um, it was just, uh, it was just incredible. It, whenever I hear those songs, I can just see myself in my car driving to London, um, you know, just hearing it. Yeah, it brings... Back. It brings that back to you. That's a, that's amazing, and I can I can picture it as you're describing it. Um, I'll have to we'll have to talk about the um, the that other side, the name of the other side. We'll put we'll maybe put a link so people can uh, can look that up too because um, I'd love to hear it and think about that vision of of seeing London. Um, and that's amazing. I mean, Jeff Picaro, I feel like um, uh, for me as well, he evokes memories of my childhood, just listening, you know, listening to albums with my parents. And um, I actually, a funny story was that when I was very young, you know, most kids listen to lullabies while they go to sleep or something like that, you know, kids albums. Um, I had to listen to Rosanna 
uh, over and over again. And my mom remembers like she'd hear the song ending and she'd sneak into my room and, and put the needle back um, so that I wouldn't wake up. Or I wouldn't, you know, yell for her to put it on again. So um, that's my memory <laughs> of um, Jeff Beccaro as a as a child, you know, just kind of connecting with um, with that music. Yeah. I, later on, I, the first time I came to the States was 1983. And I had another cassette that was my favorite. And one side was Joe's Garage. Mm -hmm. that made me the sort of <coughs> their version of the best of Joe's Garage. So they'd, they'd got it down to 45 minutes. Yeah. So it wasn't the whole album. And the other side was There and Back by Jeff Beck. Uh, with Simon Phillips playing. So mm -hmm. one side was Vinnie Colaiuta, the other side was Simon Phillips. So 1983, I was walking around the States or being on the tour bus with my old style Walkman and this cassette just, I never got tired of it. It just, you know, as soon as one side finished, it would go on the other side and uh, I just couldn't stop listening to it. I love that. And, you know, and now, you know, you are, um, with those guys among the the drummers that people listen to as you know especially for the drumming on the album which is which is just kind of a fantastic thing yeah i mean it's it's nice i mean it's i actually knew simon back when i was a kid because he lived about two miles from where we are right here now wow and you know i went and watched i was probably eight years old simon would have been about 12 13 and I went and watched him play with his dad's band. And my dad was guesting in uh, Sid Phillips Orchestra. So, uh, and I remember after Sid, Simon's dad died, I remember Simon came round to our house with his, with his mum, Judith. And he came into my little, sh I had a little shed in the garden with my drum set up. And he came in there, I, you know, I would have been about, 11 or 12 or something simon was 16. wow oh my goodness that ha that that's an amazing image in itself and i love that you actually like were playing in a shed in the backyard it literally was a shed uh another thing i might have a photo of that if i look through my dad built me a shed it wasn't particularly soundproof unfortunately for the neighbors <laughs> it was kind of a shed with um you know, old mattresses on the inside and pegboard smashed up against it. And I had all my drums out there. I used to practice in the evenings, but I would play with brushes, mm -hmm. try and keep the noise down. But it, it was it was my space, you know, it was great. That's amazing. But so so Simon, you knew Simon when you were young and, um, you know, did you did you grow up? Um, you know, playing with them or, you know, did you, um, was Simon someone who kind of like helped you along the way or were there, was there anyone else that kind of you would count among <laughs> those people that, that were influential to you that also kind of helped you along the way? Yeah, no, actually I didn't, uh, I didn't have much of a relationship with Simon back then. Mm -hmm. uh, I would love to have studied with him, but you know, by the time he was 16, 17, he was off around the world becoming yeah. a superstar. Um, a lot of my dad's friends were very helpful. There was um, the, the drummer I mentioned at the start, uh, Freddie Adamson, uh, a drummer called Paul Brody, who was the drummer of the BBC Big Band. He was very, very uh, encouraging. I would sit on his drums during when they were meant to be having a break and he would show me things. He would write things out. He would give me pairs of sticks. I mean, it couldn't have been a, a, a nicer experience. Plus seeing him play and watching him work with the orchestra, with a conductor, trying to read, you know, I'm trying to read the charts, taking in the whole the whole thing. And of course I had a couple of teachers um, in my early days. I, I had a teacher called Joe Hodson, who was real old school kind of, drummer he was a show drummer he played in the theaters in london but he insisted that he wanted me to play match grip because mm -hmm. in the early 70s he thought that was the future and ideally he would have had me play left lead as well he was a very progressive thinker even though his own drumming was kind of old style and he played traditional grip of course but um 
he he said, no, no, this is the future. You've got to get. Um, he took tip taught me sort of German grit, you know, mm -hmm. uh, with the with, with the hands, the the wrist on the top there, top of the palm. So it wasn't a, a finger thing. It was really a wrist kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And he taught me to read. And I would go and uh, see Joe play shows in the West End in the theatres. Um, he was he was very very supportive of what I did as well. But he was a tough teacher. You know, there was plenty of times where I would come home in tears, or he shouted at me for not doing the homework. Oh right. no! He was he was tough cookie. Yeah, and that was great. It, that was great. Uh, you know, my dad kind of oversaw the whole thing. And my dad obviously thought, yeah, he needs a hard time, this kid. Yeah. <laughs> so occasionally, yep. it, was, it was tough love, you know. Yeah, so, sometimes sometimes uh, parents, um, you know, know when, when their child needs a little nudge, I guess, right? Mm. Um, that's amazing, though. Um, so, yeah, so you, you came up, you know, playing what... What style were you playing back then? What style of music were you playing primarily? Well, really jazz, uh, jazz stuff, you know, swing stuff. I guess when I got to about 13, 14, I started becoming interested in more kind of funk rhythms. And I was just starting to hear, um, you know, drummers like Steve Schaefer and Steve Gadd, who were playing much more kind of straight 16th, Mm -hmm. that weren't swingy mm -hmm. and, um yeah so and i was hearing you know bands like uh, earth wind and fire uh so i was really starting to get get the idea of a backbeat you know a rock rhythm a funk rock rhythm mm -hmm. um, so that's really what i was interested in that's amazing and and how did you kind of transition from that style to, you know, the style that people primarily know you for with progressive rock? Yeah, I, I don't know. Some of it's necessity. You know, jobs came along in my past. In 1986, I was, uh, during one of my many, many periods of uh, being out of work, or at least not employed, shall we say, mm -hmm. someone said, hey, I've just heard Iggy Pop is auditioning drummers in London. And if you ring this number, talk to this guy, you can get down there tomorrow. Oh, God, great. So what do I know about Iggy Pop? Well, not much. So uh, I spoke to this uh, guy who was running the auditions. He told me the name of the two songs that I'd need to learn. They're on two different albums. So I run to a record store. I buy the two different albums. I go home. I listen to the two songs. I was the very last drummer to audition, and I played the two songs with as much sort of attitude as I could for the style of music, even though I'd never really tried to play punk music, I was well aware of punk music. Um, and surprisingly, I got the job. So I thought, wow, I don't know if I can play like that for 90 minutes. <laughs> um, and then, I, you know, I started playing with Iggy. So that changed the way I played. And I guess every job I've ever done has influenced me or pushed me a little bit in one way or another to learn different a different way of playing that's going to suit that artist or that band or or this arrangement. Um, and every job I did kind of um, molded me a bit. Uh, mm -hmm. I can remember in 1992 I got a job with a with an Italian singer. Uh, his name's Claudio Baglioni, and I didn't know who he was. I had to ring an Italian friend and say, who's, who's this guy? And he said, oh, he's really big. He plays stadiums. What? He said, <laughs> yeah, and I've just found out the bass player is going to be Tony Levin. I said, wow. Oh, my God, Tony Levin, the guy who I had idolized at that Steve Gadd, Paul, uh, Paul Simon concert only 12 years before, like the greatest – experience I'd ever had of going to watch, watch a, a group and then you know within about six weeks I'm in a rehearsal room with Tony Levin and it's like I can't believe it you know and so although Tony didn't teach me anything directly I picked up so much of his character 
and his attitude and the way that he approached music and the way that he approached, you know, the songs and the way he played the bass. He was a lot more rock and roll than I expected he was going to be. I thought yeah. he'd be super studious and every single note is written out on a piece of paper. And, you know, I thought he'd be like that. And I thought he's going to think I'm terrible. He's Tony's played with Steve Gadd. He's played with all these fantastic drummers. So I was pretty nervous, I think, the first time <laughs> I met him. And of course, he, you know, he's, he's even taller than me. He must be six foot three or something. So I was pretty intimidated on the first day, but Tony's such a nice guy and his character was so warm and, and friendly. He made me feel so relaxed within the first couple of days. You know, we were, we were really good friends pretty soon. And, um, I, you know, Tony was, he had, he had a much more rock and roll attitude about the way that he played. And I, and I think that made me change slightly from my mentality of what I'd been doing before. And every job you do, you meet people who, who kind of shape you a bit. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they actually tell you what to play and that shapes you. And sometimes just their attitude and their personality shapes you. You know, when I, when I joined Porcupine Tree, I'd never tried to play anything, let's say, metal before. Mm. And so that was a big challenge to me. Mm -hmm. I, I never really tried to do that kind of music before. And I'd never really listened to it. And mm -hmm. Steve, Steve, the singer, you know, he gave me an album of uh, a band called Miss Sugar. Mm -hmm. band, and I'd never heard anything like it. So that was a you know, a, a big moment for me to, to learn about metal music and, and the attitude and the way to hit the drums and the way to play the patterns, trying to play, you know, double bass drum. That was a big, a big change for me, really, from what I'd been doing just before uh, Porcupine Tree. Wow. That, that's amazing to hear that it, it, that, that was kind of the transition um, for you. And and Meshuggah, that's like definitely some heavy stuff there for <laughs> to intro you into that that uh, style of playing. That's great. Um, so so Tony was kind of one of those people that you would looked up to, and you you had a chance to play with. Um, can you think of any other uh, musicians that kind of fit that category as well, where you got a chance to play with them? It was someone that you'd always really admired. Oh yeah. Um in 1988, I did an album for um, a female bass player. She's called Gail Ann Dorsey. She was the bass player for David Bowie for, I think, about 20 years. And she did a solo album, and it was produced by Nathan East, who, of course, I was a massive fan of. Someone mm -hmm. else played so many albums with Jeff Picaro and Steve Gadd and all my heroes. And the plan was that Gail was going to play bass, but she won she was much more into singing and being a singer. So when it came time to um, cut the tracks, Nathan stood at the end, uh, just at the end of my bass drum with a big grin on his face and played the bass. And I just wanted to laugh because it was like, this is ridiculous. This is Nathan East. And he's standing at the end of my bass drum and he had a big grin on his face. And the hardest thing was for me to just not stop and just laugh. But it was amazing to play with someone that good. And boy, he made me sound really good. So I, I learned a lesson that you can, it, you can make other people sound better than they really are. Um, mm -hmm. Another bass player I worked with that was so good was uh, John Giblin. He's a, he's a Scottish bass player. And John just always made me sound better. So he had this very special um, sense of time. Mm. It was exactly with the way that I was feeling. He sort of played inside my time. I can't even, it's something that I can't even really quantify or even work or even want to work out. It was just, there was some magic. I would yeah. listen back. We would do sessions together and I would listen back. And I would think, I don't understand what John's doing, but he's he's like inside my time and it just feels great. That's that's amazing. And you know, even though we were 
playing with clicks, we just kind of felt the time the same way. And it and, and I started to really recognize when things had a special feel about them mm -hmm. due to the interaction of two or more players. Up to, before that, you know, before those times, I just used to play the drums and hope for the best. Mm -hmm. I didn't always recognize when I could have made an adjustment or the bass player or the guitar player could have made adjustments that we all fitted together and it sounded much better. We all just played and just that was it. We just hoped for the best. So I think that was the first time that I really recognized that you could have a really special time feel with another player that's really on your on your wavelength. Right. Like some something, you know, you were kind of like the same brain for for a time period almost, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, everyone feels time in, in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you you're watching YouTube and you can hear an introduction. There's like a clavinet or something and a drummer's sitting there waiting to start. And when the drummer starts, I, I think, oh, I wouldn't have placed the beats there. Mm. It's not where I would have, you know, I can already imagine where my drums are going to go when I listen to the introduction. Say there's eight bars of clavinet. Mm -hmm. I, can always, I can already picture where I'm going to place the time. And then I might be watching a drummer on YouTube and then he comes in and I think, oh, I wouldn't have put the beats there. That feels all weird to me. Right. But, not wrong or right it's just you know a difference of um how you feel time everyone feels time a little bit differently and sometimes you find players that are really on your wavelength and can um play time in a certain way it's hard to explain isn't it yeah i i think um you know, it's it's also like any relationship um or conversation with someone sometimes you have a conversation with someone and they finish your sentences, right? Or you're on the same page as them and you realize, oh yeah, they think like me. Um, or you have a creative, you know, partner who understands where your brain is going and you can kind of throw something out there and they pick it, pick it up. And I think like music is like that too, where you, um, you know, you are, to, you're doing something together and it either you're either you're on the same page and you finish each other's sentences, so to speak, um, or you know sometimes it doesn't work so well like that. Um, but you know that's why I think about like the musical relationship is really similar to other relationships in life. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it was something that I, my dad would always say, you know, back in the days of when he was working in the nightclub. He would say he would come home and he'd say, "Oh man, we've got this drummer this month playing with this artist, and his time really sucks, and he's driving mm -hmm. us all crazy." And then other times, my dad would come back and say, "Man, we've got this, we got this guy called Charlie Persip, and he's he's backing the artist in the club that month. He's mm -hmm. the best drummer, and he just makes the whole band come alight." And it's quite interesting because this is way before the days of anyone playing to a click. This really is the drummer's time. It's mm -hmm. not it's not metronomic time. It's that drummer's time. And certain drummers, my dad would say, "Ah, oh, it was fabulous, and we all loved it. All you know, everyone in the trumpet section, the saxes, the trombone players, mm -hmm. everyone in the band loved playing with that drummer, or sometimes not." And it was always about their feel, always about their time, their sense of time. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is that every once in a blue moon, the drummer of the house band would have a problem like he, his car's broken down or something. And the band leader knew my dad could play drums. So my dad would sit on the drums and cover for the house band drummer sometimes. And my dad, you know, he didn't have any coordination or anything. He could just play a ride cymbal, ding, 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 and four and a bar bass drum and probably a little bit of left hand. And the band really liked playing with my dad on drums. <laughs> he had no, no licks, no fills. He wasn't hitting crash cymbals. He was just playing time. And so he, he used to talk about that quite a lot, about the way the drummer 
was making the music feel. And that was very interesting to me because as a young drummer, that's sort of the last thing you think of. All you're worried about is can I, how fast can I do this? And, and how many things can I hit? And, you know, can I get a bigger drum kit? Uh, you know, <laughs> you're, you're not thinking about how am I making the music feel? Mm -hmm. About how, if, can I play faster and can I spin sticks and, you know, you're much right. more technically focused. The, the feel thing, the time thing takes a lot, you know, many years later you start thinking, yeah, actually I can feel the difference. Mm -hmm. and I can do something about it. Yeah, and I would say that's one of the things that, you know, people can, can recognize um, in your playing too is just, um, you know, you're not, you're not playing to play fast. You're not playing all over the place. You're not the flashy with, with stick tricks and things like that. Um, but what you play always contributes to the music in a really kind of special way. And I'm wondering like, how in the world do you come up with those parts? Um, you know, your creativity, how, how does that process work for you when you're writing a part or coming up with something? Um, how is your brain working to kind of process that? Well, normally, uh, you know, someone will send me a song and there's normally a guide drum track, program drums usually. So the first thing I'll do is I'll listen to the song without hearing their program drums just to think, OK, well, what would I want to play? What mm -hmm. could I play through? The I listen to the the rhythms that are being played on the bass, on the guitar, on the keyboards, the vocals. What kind of thing could I do on the drums that would have, you know, would be a meaningful contribution? Of course, I can just play time, dead straight time, try to just make it feel good, and that's good. That's enough. But maybe I could find a little slightly off, off the path rhythm that could make the song special and that the drum part could be unique for that song, a signature drum part for that song. I'm also well aware when it's not necessary, when I think, yeah, you know what, it just needs, the best thing I can do on this song is just play one and three on the bass drum, two and four on the snare drum, and eights on the hi-hat. That's all this song needs. I, I don't try to, you know, force in some clever drum part just for the sake of it. So. Depending on how complicated the song is, what I normally do is I put it on Logic Audio, which is just over there on my iMac, and I put colored bars in on a, on a MIDI track, empty colored bars. So the intro, I might make that green. It might be 16 bars. It might be 15 bars or whatever. Then the first verse, I might do it in yellow. Then the bridge, I might do it in blue. The chorus, I might do it in red. That way, I can sit here playing the drums and I can see the section that's coming up next because I'm trying desperately to not have to sit and write out a chart, a note for note chart, because at that point, I don't actually know what I want to play. Um, if I write a chart, well, then I'm going to just have to write the amount of bars. So unless there's any tricky figures or odd time signatures or accents that I might need to write out. Well, I will write those out. But mostly I'm just looking at colored bars. I'm thinking, OK, well, that whole yellow section is the verse. So let me just play around the verse a few times and I'll start recording straight away. And I'll just play whatever comes into my head. It might be the simplest thing. It might be a complicated thing. And then I'll, I'll move on to the bridge and the chorus and then I'll start I'll go to the computer and I'll just listen to two or three takes and I'll think, oh, there was something nice there. But what I did in bar four of the first verse, the way the place that I open the hi-hat works beautifully around that vocal. Mm -hmm. So I've got, to rem I've got to remember to do that. Now, I like this. I don't like that. I like this, don't like that. So I start making a map of the shape of the arrangement. Okay, so this verse is definitely a breakdown verse so maybe i'm going to thin out what i'm going to play now this chorus is very very heavy so maybe i'm going to be playing open hi-hat or i'm going to be on a china symbol or something follow the dynamics of the song 
And I might work on the song anywhere between about an hour and a week until I think, yeah, this I've got the best part that I can think of at this moment in time. It could happen that a few weeks later I listen to the song or a few years later I listen to the song and think, I've just thought of a much better part. <laughs> <laughs> ah, damn. And sometimes it happens in a band where I've recorded the album, we start playing the songs live, and then one night I start doing something a bit different. I think, oh, God, this is so much better than what's on the album. Ah, I just couldn't think of it at the time. You do your best at the time. That's all you can do. Probably every record I've ever recorded, I could now think of a better way to play it or a better sound or a better groove or better fills. But, you know, it's that moment in time. Mm -hmm. and I know what I'm looking for. I think I've done it so many times. I've got a good sense of when something is working and when something isn't working, when it might be a great drum part, but it's just not fitting the song. You know, you've got to zoom out and think, okay, I'm thinking very much like a drummer here. Let me zoom out and imagine I'm the singer. Mm. Would I want all that distraction behind me at that moment in the song? No. Uh, so I'll I'll carefully craft, you know, design a whole a whole rhythm or a whole set of rhythms for the whole song, and then I'll present it to whoever the band or artist is always imagining they're going to write back and say, oh, no, I hated that. That was horrible. And 99% of the time they say, wow, great, love it. Okay, let's move on to the next song. Sometimes someone might say, oh, I think you could have done a bigger fill here. Or I was hoping that it would break down to just hi-hat and bass drum in this part. So it's easy for me to drop in. Mm. And uh, But, you know, you're playing drummer, engineer, arranger and producer all in the same kind of all under the same umbrella right and, and working remotely as we all do so much there's no one here to give you instant feedback i might do a song work on it for a few days send it to someone in los angeles mm -hmm. i don't hear back from them for two days before they might say oh could you play cross stick in the second verse oh god so <laughs> by which time I might be working on something else. So sometimes I take a, a little photograph on my iPhone of the snare drum, the ride cymbal, the hi-hats I was using, maybe if I've changed crash cymbal. So I've got to remember, I've got to go back to something I was doing two days ago to drop in. Right, right. And that's, and you've been doing a lot um, of remote recording, right, through this through this uh, time where we're in the midst of a pandemic and we're all kind of at home, um, quarantined. Um, so you have your setup behind you um, and I've seen your space, which is incredible. Uh, so you, yeah, you're really all set up to kind of do a lot of this, a lot of this work. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I've been doing it, I guess, for about the last 20, 23 years I've been mm -hmm. in this house with this special space for a studio. So, um, you know, it's been an interesting learning curve, as well as from an engineering point of view, learning really how to mic drums up, how to mix drums, uh, uh, you know, how to affect the drums in EQ and compression and all sorts of tricks you can do with the, the mixing part of it. And it's taught me a lot about playing the drums and being consistent and how... Really, you've got to play the mix you want. If you want the hi-hat to be quieter, well, just do it again and play the hi-hat quieter. Mm -hmm. That's easier than trying to turn the hi-hat down because sometimes the hi-hat's like, it's so much in the snare mic and in the tom mics, you turn the hi-hat down on the fader, it's like, well, actually, that <laughs> it's exactly the same. Right. It's like, I can't get rid of this hi-hat. All right, well, <laughs> I'm going to do it again. Maybe I'll choose some quieter hi-hats or I just remember to play them much quieter. It's much better that you play the mix than try and fix it um, in the computer later on. That's always the longer and less convincing uh, route you can take. That is, that's really some great advice for, for everyone who's recording at home right now. 
Um, and I, you know, we're looking at your setup um, behind you. You, we were on a clinic tour together um, years back. And I just remember how incredibly uh, specific your setup was. And um, for anyone who has seen a clinic, you know, at a, um, a drum clinic at a music store, we go on these clinic tours and it's, you know, one day is at one stop and then we get on a plane and we fly to the next city, do another, another clinic at another drum shop. And so you're really at the mercy of what the drum shop provides for gear. You know, you have a, you have a rider and um, you have listed what you need, but you know, the, the, the shop may have this or they may have that. And, um, you know, so one thing that struck me about you setting up every day was you would have different gear, different things, different challenges presented to you, but um, you were, you, you're so specific with your setup. Everything is very, very precise, which kind of like translates into your playing, I think. Um, and you would figure it out. You know, you would make things work from what you had. Um, you would uh, improvise here and there when you needed to with the gear. Um, and it was just an incredibly, um, interesting to me to watch you do that night after night um, and then play perfectly, you know, just like the night before with whatever uh, setup that you had. And so, you know, I think about that um, and how you um, have done that throughout your career with your gear and kind of um, making things that worked for you. And we've talked a lot about, uh, you know, uh, R&D projects and ideas and inventions and I don't know if that's something that people know about you, how you kind of create what you need sometimes. Yeah, in fact, I remember back in the 1986 time when I was playing with Iggy Pop, there were so many songs that um, had like fast eights. You know. And of course, I had to play really loud. So I was really struggling playing it like this. Um, it was really awkward. So I thought what I want is a closed hi-hat down here. I'll move the floor tom over to the right. So I made my own X-hat by getting a cymbal stand, um, putting it at the bottom of a hi-hat uh, cymbal on, and then I would put um, a hi-hat clutch upside down over the rod of the cymbal stand, tighten it down, take the top off, put the top symbol on, and tighten the bottom of the hi-hat clutch on the top of the hi-hat to close it down. Mm -hmm. So I, I think they were, I think there was a range called Z symbols, right? It was the first time yep. children had made those super heavy symbols. Yes. And so I had a pair, and I could, uh, by undoing this hi-hat clutch, the top of it, I could loosen the hi-hats or clamp them down. So I could play, you know, fast eights down here, and then it would leave me a lot of space to really do the back beats. So a lot of those songs in Iggy's set that were sort of da 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 suddenly mm -hmm. became a lot easier because I wasn't crossed over. So sometimes you need to invent something that doesn't exist. Sometimes you've just got to get the hacksaw out and the drill yes. out. And try to make. You've got an idea for for, for something, um, much like these little bell symbols. You think I really want. They don't make them at the moment. I'm going to have to make them myself. So mm -hmm. sometimes you've just got to find a solution, a creative solution that that works for you to get the job done that you need to do. Absolutely. And I picture you every time I see those cup chimes, I picture you with your um, I just in your I think you said you were in your garage and you had like a some kind of a, a saw a cutting tool or something, right? Like, oh, I used to put the symbols onto a drill. So I would have uh, these little, you know, I, I, I started by doing it because I wanted these little bell symbols and I mm -hmm. had some old uh, Zildjian crash symbols in my in my garage mm -hmm. and I thought I'm gonna just make them myself you know so mm -hmm. I, I got a I got a pen and I I, I I marked out what I wanted to cut I would cut it with these big horrible um, 
I think they're called tin snips. Tin snips, yes. And they're really hard work. Sometimes you're doing like the bottom of a hi hat symbol. <laughs> <laughs> so hard that you end up with this very jagged, unfinished round, well, not round symbol. Mm. And then I got, I took the top of a of a of a symbol stand, just the top rod, and I managed to jam it in the end of a drill. <laughs> then with some with a lot of heavy felts, I could attach. The, the rough cut symbol onto the drill. So I've got this really rough piece of metal spinning round at very high speeds. <laughs> and I'd put some uh, emery cloth, you know, kind of sandpaper for metal mm -hmm. on the ground. And um, with this drill, I would try, uh, this thing would be going crazy. And I'm just trying to smooth it into a circle. That's <laughs> all it was. And it was, all the dust is coming up in my face. I wouldn't recommend it. Right. Do not try this at home, right? I found a local blacksmith who could do the job for me. Much safer. <laughs> much, much safer. And of course, later on, I actually managed to get Paul Francis to um, to make me some uh, at the factory, you know. Yeah. And, it, and it, that sound, I mean, the sound of those cup chimes, I feel like is really signature to you. Um, and I love that. It's so great. Um, so... I have a question for you. You know, we see how precise you are um, on, in your drums and in your setup. I feel like um, when I picture you in your everyday life, Gavin, I like I picture the most organized <laughs> human being. Like everything has its place, and I'm just wondering if that's true. Is, does that translate into your life outside of no, drumming? Not at all. No. I no? mean, I am, I am pretty kind of crazy about drums, and uh, um. I'm very particular about the tuning and the, the rims and, the mm -hmm. and every, if, if I can find anything that would either make the job easier, simpler, less set up time, better sound, less vibration, anything that any gadget from anywhere, if it's going to improve my total output, then I'm ready to do it. If I find some little gadget that's going to, kind of transform something I do, then I'm there. I'm really, mm -hmm. but drums, the drumming part of it is really the only aspect of my life that I'm really that obsessive with. Um, you know, I haven't got all my, um, all my underwear lined up in little, you know. <laughs> Color-coded, right? Yeah, I know people who are like that. You know, they have all their shirts folded and it's all like you could put a ruler next to it. And all their socks and underwear are sort of in a straight line. I, I'm not like that. I don't actually care about that. So I even wear odd socks. But um, the drumming thing was the only thing that I thought, I'm so interested in this. I want it to be as good as it can possibly be. So there's no point doing a, a sort of half-baked thing. I've got to go flat out and go to the nth degree to get get it right the sound the performance the recording the microphones the sim everything get it as good as i can get it and it's an it's an ever moving target you know uh i'm always interested in new gear new sounds new microphones new plugins anything i can do that would improve my drumming i'll do it uh it's like a, a lifelong mission Mm -hmm. I think if, well, I, if I ever got to the point where I thought, well, I can play perfectly and I sound perfect, then I probably would give up. That would be the end of the road. I don't want to get to the end of the road. I don't think I ever will. No. Right. It's a, it's always a process. It's a journey, right? Yeah. That's amazing. And I, um, you know, we, we hear you play um, in music, recorded music with bands all the time. Um, but you're also, you know, besides doing the clinics, you're a fantastic soloist. Um, one of my favorite things that I've seen you do, um, maybe one of the funnest things was the the David Letterman solo when he had you on for um, drum solo week. And I, I didn't know who was coming up on the show. Um, you know, from, from show to show. So as people were coming on, I was like, oh, yay, it's so-and-so. I was so excited to see you on there because I knew that, you know, David Letterman must have asked someone, I know he's a drumming fan, but he must have asked someone like, who should I have on? And so to see you on there was so cool. 
um, so much fun. Uh, how was that for you? Well, very bizarre. Very, very yeah. bizarre. You know, I've obviously I've seen Dave Letterman show when I've been in the States and on some distant sort of a cable channel, you can see it over here in the UK too. But it's always been this thing that happens in another land, you know, in another galaxy. Mm -hmm. So to get a call, and the way it happened was uh, Paul Schaefer, the MD of the show, the, the keyboard player, his son was having drum lessons with a drummer called Lou Calderola. Okay. And one day, they'd already done the first drumming week. Mm -hmm. and, uh, one day, Paul went to pick up his son who was having drum lessons with Lou, and he said, oh, hey, we're going to do another drum week on The Letterman Show. Have you got any favorites? Who would you recommend? And he said, oh, I like this band called Porcupine Tree, and I, I like this drummer called Gavin Harrison. And I doubt Paul had heard of me. And he said, oh, okay, I'll check him out. And he, he must have checked me out, you know, on record or on YouTube or something. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing I know, I got a call from our manager. And he said, look, you're coming to, in August, you're coming to New York City to play on Dave Letterman's show. I said, with who? And he said, no, no, you're going to play a drum solo on the Dave Letterman show. Because I didn't even know about this drumming week. Yeah. And I said, what? Are you joking? He said, no, no, no. It's in four weeks' time. And I put the phone down. And I said, what? That, that's uh, unbelievable. And then I got an email from Paul Schaefer, and we started discussing what we're going to play. You know, he said, I want you to do three minutes, 20 or three minutes, 25 or something, and you have to use uh, – I'd like you to use the band. And so I thought, well, wow, what can I do in that specific time frame? Mm -hmm. I had big band charts that I'd done for um, – that I'd worked on, you know, with Lawrence Cottle. And I thought, you know what, I've done – I've been the, the, the drummer in the house band of TV shows. The chance of rehearsing is always – that's the last thing on the list. You know, they're doing lights and cameras and makeup. They always mm -hmm. forget about the rehearsal part. So I said, look, let's just do the chicken. That's a really easy song. Everyone knows the chicken. And so I worked out an arrangement of the chicken on my computer with a tempo and that would bring it the whole thing to 3 minute 22 or something. So uh, I wrote back to Paul and said, look, this is what I'd like you to do. I'd like the band to play the head of the song. I'll play a 15 bar drum solo on bar 16. We'll all play, ba -da, ba -ba 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 -da, but then I'll do another 15 bars. That will happen four times and then we'll play the head again. But actually being in New York City, in the theater, getting called up on stage, you know, I was sitting in the, in the empty audience seats watching the rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And getting pretty nervous. And then uh, the stage manager walks on and says, okay, is Gavin Harrison in the building? We're going to do the drum solo thing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> this is like, you know, an audition at school or something. <laughs> you know, and there's, there's Will Lee on bass. I mean, yeah. one of absolute heroes. I'm, wow, I'm going to play with Will Lee. This is unbelievable. And I got up on stage and played. And, it, you know, it, it went great. It went went really apart from the fact I dropped a stick, but it went very well. I had prepared more or less what I was going to play, not note for note, but what I'm going to do in the four solos. I'm going mm -hmm. to do this kind of thing and a bit of that. And then the second solo, because I know that when I get up there, if I hadn't prepared anything, more than likely my head would go blank and I would just play a load of rubbish. Mm -hmm. Under pressure, I know what happens under pressure. I've played under pressure a lot of times, and I know what can happen to you and that your mind can just turn to mush. Mm. You can't remember what day it is. You don't, suddenly you, you can't play the drums. Everything's foreign. The lights are on. The audience, there's cameras everywhere. The pressure can really get to you. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of pressure. I, I sat in the dressing room watching the show. I was the last thing on the show, of course. Mm -hmm. so I had to sit there watching 55 minutes of the show in my dressing room, thinking, oh, my God, there's no way out of this now. 
and, you know, and you say, okay, we're going for a break and we'll be back with uh, Rose Byrne and, and Gavin Harrison. And every time he said my name, it just sounded so, so foreign, like, what? what? Mm -hmm. And then before you know it, you're, you said, okay, we're having a break. And after the break, we've got Gavin Harrison. And then I'm standing there and Dave Letterman came over and he said, oh man, nice drums. And, uh, Hey, oh, hey, so you're from England? Yeah, blah, blah. Uh, okay, 30 seconds. <laughs> you know, the, the build-up is is incredible. Mm -hmm. You've one chance to do it, and uh, you know that millions of people are going to see it, and it will be on YouTube. And so I think what people don't really appreciate when they watch it is the amount of pressure you would feel if it was you sitting there. That's something else. It's easy yeah. when you are back in your armchair watching it and think, oh, I could have done that. Well, why do you play that? Oh, I could do that. Yeah, wait till you're sitting there. The amount of pressure is crazy. I, I can imagine. I'm actually, like, I can feel the nerves. I <laughs> feel it. Um, but it was, it was so, so great. And I don't know if you've seen there. Someone put together a collaboration, uh, like, clips of, um, of David Letterman saying, great drums oh i love your drums you know he with all the <laughs> all the guest musicians on the show over the years i love that um i actually uh selected a set of symbols for for david letterman once he wanted a a kit um he was really specific about the sound um that he wanted for his symbol so um he's just a fan of drumming which i love yeah and how cool you know i know johnny carson was really into drummers too Mm -hmm. and, Johnny, and Johnny could play a bit, and probably that rubbed off on Dave Letterman. You know, and Dave Letterman did thousands and thousands of shows, and every night he's got a band on, and you know, you've got to, you've got to hand it to him. That was a quite a brave move to say, oh, do you know what? Let's not have a band on this week. Let's just have the drummer do a solo." Mm -hmm. And that, and of course, the first week, you know, Anton, the, the house band drummer, played, and and he's a fantastic drummer too. Yeah. So to to see that, you know, that a, that a real primetime TV host would give the drummer some time is is fantastic. Yeah, I, I loved that too. Just uh, seeing you all up there and um, and all of the so all of all of the drummers that he had on are are um, you know you're all known for just your tasty playing. You know, like the solos are just really really um, fantastic. Um, you know, and musical, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So um, great, great move. Um, I want to see more of that stuff on primetime television. Yeah. When, we, when we get back after after the virus. Um, um, and, you know, uh, speaking of where we're at right now, um, what what does the what is your uh, kind of musical life look like coming up do you have some things on the horizon what are you um what are you looking forward to in um 2021 virus what virus <laughs> um yeah well you know all the touring got cancelled this year and has been pushed into next year mm -hmm. the next thing that we've got booked is June and July with King Crimson in the States. I just hope by then enough people have had the vaccine, uh, that the virus has gone down so significantly that the authorities feel comfortable letting thousands of people into a space, you know, because it can't work. If you say, look, we can only have a third capacity, well, then it just can't work because no no artist can afford to lose that much money. Mm -hmm. You really would just lose money. If there's only a third of the audience, they're not going to pay three times the price to make up the difference. And to be honest, it's normally, you know, 60, 70, 75% before you even break even. So uh, playing to a third empty house is not an option. So I hope by June, you know, the vaccines of the world have, have made their mark. And hopefully there's some kind of way that the, the virus is going down and that we can get back to touring as we used to, because this, this industry has been hit ridiculously hard. No theater, no concerts, nothing's happened since uh, March this year. 
and probably nothing's going to happen before March next year at the very earliest. I think mm -hmm. even June might be optimistic. So there's that tour booked. And then after that, there's um, uh, a European tour with the Pineapple Thief booked. And again, you know, we just hope it's going to be a, a, a possibility. Yes, my my fingers are crossed as well that things can, um, you know, can get back. Um, we'd say the new normal, that the new no new normal can uh, can take place. But, um, you know, I can't wait to to see you all again and, ha you know, have you come back around. And um, I I think that, you know, I, I agree with you. It's probably going to be into the middle toward the end of next year before things kind of um, pick up again. And, you know, we both have so many friends who are really affected by everything that's that's gone on. Um, but, you know, I we a lot of new music is being recorded right now. We are seeing uh, a lot of, um, you know, live streamed concerts, which, which has been amazing. Um, you know, everyone trying to get out there and bring music because music is what we all live for, you know, and it, and it, and it um, you know, it makes us all really happy. And um, I think we, you know, are staying positive through some of this new, new music that's that has come out, um, which is a good thing. So, you know, but my fingers are crossed as we're, well. We're writing and recording all the time. It's been a, it's been a good year in terms of uh, catching up with lots of projects and lots of sessions. Um, that, that's been a godsend, really, that that I, I've got, at least got the chance to record as well as practice. Uh, I know there's lots of drummers out there who can't get to their practice space or they're sitting at home with a practice pad or electronic kit and they're frustrated by that. Um, and I, I fully sympathize with them. Um, that's, that's a horrible situation. Uh, there was plenty of times where I, you know, I was relying on renting a, a rehearsal space which probably I wouldn't be allowed to go to right now. So right. Uh, I've, um, I've been in a lucky, it wasn't the way I designed it, but it was the way it just worked out lucky that I've got a studio and I've got the drums set up the whole time. So if I want to practice or record, it's it's all here ready to go. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, we I think we're all a little bit anxious to kind of um, – get out and see people again and, and interact with people. And, you know, part of, part of making music is um, bringing it to the fans. And, um, you know, I think that's a, a big part of being a musician is, is playing on stage, seeing the audience reactions, you know, and then, and then the tour life, which is, you know, it's a whole other aspect in itself. And um, sometimes it's a lot of fun and sometimes it's tough. Um, but you know, those, those things that come out of the road, the time on the road and, and, um, the interesting people, um, that you meet, um, and you recently told me a funny story. Um, so we'll, we'll wrap things up on a, a with a funny story, um, about a, a fan that came out, um, and it was in Italy. Is that right? Yeah. I was setting up for, a for a drum clinic in Italy. And uh, I was with the, the promoter guy and we'd set the drums up and I played a little and suddenly the, bur the doors burst open and two Italian policemen walk through. I mean, they, they carry guns as well out there, which I'm not used to seeing. UK police don't carry guns. So these two guys walk in with guns and they're strolling around looking at the drum kit. And um, one of them says to the promoter, can I have a picture with Gavin behind the drums? I'm a drummer. He's like, oh, wow. Meanwhile, I can hear their radios. They've got these radio in their pockets. And I know enough Italian. I could hear them saying, you know, where are you? We need you for an incident. Uh, please respond. And he just turned his radio off, <laughs> came back round the drums, and we did some photos together, me and these two Italian policemen. Uh, actually, I remember a time in the late 80s in Belfast Island, where there was a lot of uh, trouble in those days, and a British soldier was patrolling the arena we were about to perform in, and he had a massive gun, a humongous thing. And he came up on stage and he said, um, you the drummer? I said, yeah. He said, 
can I have a go on your drums? <laughs> can I have a go on your gun? <laughs> <laughs> right. it was, yeah. it here, hold time. this. Imagine if he just handed his gun out. Here, hold this while I play your your drums. Put right? it down on the floor behind wow. the drums. I mean, I didn't pick it up, of course. But <laughs> could he play? Time. Could he play? <laughs> yeah, he could play. It's amazing how many people you you come across in in everyday life, and they oh, I play drums. <laughs> Right, right, exactly. Um, so speaking of police, I have a, a funny story, and I don't know if you, I don't know if you remember this, but we were on that clinic tour that I mentioned earlier, and we were in Memphis. Um, and late, um, it was the clinic was really late, and I think we just grabbed a quick bite bite to eat afterward. But it was it was fairly late at night. Um, we were right across the street from the hotel, um, heading back across the the street was completely desolate. There was no one, no cars or anything. Um, so we were just gonna walk right ac directly across the street to the hotel, um, but thought twice about it because we saw a police officer on the other side, right by the hotel. And we thought, oh, we better not, you know, let's not get caught jaywalking. And um, <laughs> we gotta get Gavin to the next tour stop the next day. So we went up, you know, we did what we should. We walked up to the light and waited for the walk sign and crossed and went back to the hotel. And um, <laughs> we walking into the hotel past this police officer um, and then both looked at each other and realized this was not an actual police officer. This was someone dressed up um, as the night's entertainment, apparently. So we <laughs> were like just laughing so hard, like we just got, you know, totally fooled into following the, the rules and walking around the right way by um not a real police officer yeah. you see yeah fun times on the road right <laughs> um so let's um let's kind of leave everyone with um some advice if you have uh any advice for you know up and coming musicians drummers anyone who wants to kind of follow the path and uh follow their passion into the music industry the, the best advice I can give to young drummers, I, I think, is to just work on your time and work on your sound. They are the two things that everyone's going to notice. And everyone's, you know, your bandmates are going to appreciate. And it's going to make people want to play with you. If you've got a really nice drum sound and you've got good time, that's really the, the key to success, in my opinion. So... You know, rather than spending a lot of energy trying to play super fast, tricky, a go go bell solos or something, if you spend some time thinking about how can I improve my time and how can I improve my drum sound, um, they're really two things that even the man in the street would recognize as this guy's good or this guy's not so good. The little technical stuff, it's only other drummers who would even understand what you're trying to do mm -hmm. but, but the time and the sound is, is what I I usually tell young drummers look just work on that I mean you can work on your reading too but that's an avenue of work which you may or may not be interested in pursuing if you want to be a professional drummer I would recommend you want to learn to read and practice reading and try and improve your reading it'll just improve your chances of employment there were plenty of times in my life where being able to read got me out of a lot of trouble and got my my rent paid let's say you know especially in the early days you don't know what kind of job you might get offered but having that skill was something that was very useful to me it might not be useful to you if you're just playing in a covers band, in a rock band, or just playing for fun, it might be an avenue that you don't care for. But the timing is always important, and having a good drum sound is always important. Absolutely. That's great advice. Uh, thank you so much, Gavin. It was great to see you, great to talk with you and catch up. Um, and I so appreciate your time. And let's uh, hope that you know, we get together and we're all able to be in the same room hearing music, playing music um, this this year. Absolutely. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for tuning in today. 
Join us each Tuesday for new episodes of Sarah Hagen Backstage.